So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Copperfields Books virtual event with Dr. Timothy Smith. This is our first New Year's event, so happy New Year's to all of you that we haven't seen in a few days. My name is Jamie Madsen, and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfields, and I will also be your host for the evening. Copperfields Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. I want to take a moment here and again thank all of you for your continued support throughout COVID-19. Without it, we would be unable to provide free events like tonight, so we at Copperfields remain very grateful. So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started this evening. I will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, links to purchase tonight's title, as well as a 10% discount code for use online. And I'll also include my contact details for follow-up and post-event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to tonight with any questions or comments for the speaker. The format will feature between 20 to 30 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a live Q&A and discussion. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce tonight's author, Dr. Timothy Smith. Dr. Timothy Smith has been studying and practicing alternative, functional, nutritional, and conventional healing practices for almost 50 years. His most recent focus has been on the latest research developments in molecular, functional, and nutritional medicine and epigenetics applied to the prevention and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Smith has been a member of numerous professional organizations, including the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, the American Psychiatric Association, the American College for the Advancement of Medicine, the American Academy of Functional Medicine, and the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He is here with us tonight to discuss his most recent title, Reversing Alzheimer's, How to Prevent Dementia and Revitalize Your Brain. I know we're all excited to dive right in and what a perfect time in the year. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it straight over to you to take it away for us. Uh, thank you so much, Jamie. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I hope, I hope we're able to uh, clarify this subject for people and, and I appreciate their interest in it. So, um, so I just wanna start out by saying that we all know Alzheimer's is a horrible disease. It's horrible because it robs us of who we are. It takes our memory away. And so we can't remember the things we've done and who we are. In terms of numbers, it's the third most common disease of all after heart attacks and strokes, heart attacks and cancer, I mean. And um, one in three of us will die with Alzheimer's or with dementia. That's a huge number. One, one in three of people alive today will die with with dementia, um, I'm I'm uh, I've done a lot of radio interviews in the past couple of weeks since my book came out, and one of the one of the radio broadcaster hosts, uh, he said, uh, he said, you're on a, on a mission to to uh, stop Alzheimer's, and I said, well, I never thought of it quite that way, but I guess I guess I am. Um, the, the, my hope with this book is that we can stop this plague in its tracks. And I think that the kinds of, of new developments, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that we've, we, the new research developments that we have come to be able to apply to the treatment of Alzheimer's is going to get us there. Dr. Dale Bredesen, the researcher who I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute, who discovered the, the idea that started this ball rolling in terms of being able to reverse Alzheimer's. He, he has said that he believes that 99% of all Alzheimer's disease is treatable, reversible, and curable. And I, I agree with that number. I think that uh, we have to start early. That's important, but I think that there's, uh, no theoretical reason, no practical reason why we can't eradicate this awful, awful epidemic. Um, a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's is, is 
pretty much tantamount to a death sentence at this point in time. And the sad fact is that in the past hundred years, since Alwa Alzheimer, Dr. Alzheimer, discovered the disease, there has been no treatment that worked. And there's not been a single patient that's been cured of this disease until Dr. Bredesen came along. And so uh, no treatment that worked, no, nothing even that would, that would slow down in any significant way the inexorable progress of the disease. So now there is real hope with these, with these new developments. And it was, it was finding out about this information that uh, stimulated me to, to uh, want to write this book. And now we have now entered the era of treatable and reversible Alzheimer's and of preventable Alzheimer's. And that's what my book is about. So I wanna tell you a little bit about how I came about writing this book. I, I started my, my early years in medicine were, um, uh, when I graduated from medical school in 1970, I was an intern and the within weeks of, of starting my medical practice as an intern, I started realizing that there was something wrong here, something very wrong. We were passing out a lot of drugs that made people sicker, and we were passing out medicines and drugs that only suppressed symptoms. And uh, there wasn't what I would call real healing and curing happening uh, on, on any significant scale. And a lot of people were getting surgery, and many of those surgeries were really not necessary. So I started looking around for other ideas early on in my career. And in those days, I went to lectures by Linus Pauling, who had just almost discovered DNA. He thought it was a triple helix instead of a double helix and came that close. He, but he also was interested in what we, what we call molecular medicine. He wanted to know what happens on a genetic level in terms of disease and how, how we could how we could intervene. And in fact, his first Nobel Prize was for just that. He, he discovered how sickle cell anemia was a link to a specific gene. And if that gene could be altered, so could the disease. And that, those ideas stuck with me my entire career. I spent a lot of, uh, I, I, I spent the next 30 years integrating alternative and mainstream medicine in a family practice setting. And, um, and really enjoying it and really getting a chance to see people get better. I used a lot of acupuncture and Chinese medicine, was very much involved in that. And I uh, uh, recommended herbs and vitamins and nutrients and other things to treat disease. And if we needed antibiotics or blood pressure drugs, we used them, but it was always as a kind of last resort, not, not the first line. And in, in, so that was my the kind of the, the orientation I had in my medical practice. And then in 2000, my mother developed Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and um, this was a, a, a very difficult period in my life because I had nothing to offer her. There was no alternative or mainstream medicine of any kind or treatment that it made any difference in that disease. And she went downhill fairly rapidly. I think the nutritional medicine that she had been taking and the supplements and things helped keep her from getting it as soon as she would have otherwise. But uh, in 2003, she died. And um, uh, as I was saying, it was just a very frustrating time and, and sad time in my life because not only was I losing my mother, but as a doctor, I was to, unable to offer her really anything in, in terms of medicine, we obviously gave her the usual care and support and love, but, but uh, in terms of actual medicine, there wasn't anything. And this was almost exactly 100 years after Alzheimer's had discovered the disease. So fast forward another 11 years, and we're at 2014 now, and I'm visiting my mother-in-law, my 95-year-old mother-in-law, Freka, uh, at her apartment at Spring Lake Village. And um, she's, she's actually turning 100 in February. Uh, we're gonna have, the birthday part of it's gonna be a little difficult because she's, uh, uh, you know, in a kind of lockdown situation with COVID, but it, we'll have to figure that one out. But anyway, 
she she came over to me and she knew I was very interested in the brain and in Alzheimer's and she handed me a, a paper and she said, Tim, you might be interested in reading this. It's it's um, uh, uh, it's it's about a, a doctor and I had she had just gone to a lecture he had given at the Buck Institute, and um, so this was a the, the the first paper that showed that Alzheimer's could be reversed. The only problem is. I don't think very many people who read it understood that that was what it was. And I took one look at it and I realized because what, what Dr. Bredesen had done is to apply all of the kinds of principles of functional medicine that I had learned and that I'd been practicing for over 30 years, over 40 years at that point. And um, uh, he, he, uh, uh, was had been a researcher in and looking at uh, neurologic problems, and it, he really didn't know a lot about functional medicine. But his wife was a family practice doctor in Marin County, and um, uh, she sort of talked him into trying using alternative ideas to treat Alzheimer's. And so he he did, and he did a great job of it. He he had. 10 patients. And what he did with these patients was he took each one individually and, and, and uh, did laboratory studies, what we call biomarker testing, to determine what metabolic imbalances were going on with them. And I'll go over what those are in a minute, if, if, assuming we have time. And, and, he, and then he did, developed for each of these 10 research patients, he did, he developed a treatment program based on correcting those metabolic imbalances. And each patient had a unique personalized version of that. And so each patient had a different treatment, treatment but he cured nine out of 10 of those people. The 10th one, the one that wasn't cured, was uh, a very advanced case and, and there was no um, getting him back to normal again. But the other, but I looked at this paper and I thought, this is the first person, this is the first time in the history of Alzheimer's disease that anyone has been cured of this disease. And Dr. Bredesen had done it. So I thought about that and I thought about how he had done it. And I realized that I was in a perfect position in terms of my training and background to understand in a way that most uh, doctors and most people wouldn't. Uh, what he had done, and I was also an experienced writer at that point, and had um, uh, that that skill. And I it took me about two weeks to come to the idea of writing this book, and that was in at the very end of the year in 2014, and so and it was released about, what about a month ago. So and I spent all that time um, cutting way back on my social life, and uh, and uh, not having <laughs> a lot of a lot of uh, fun with my new grandchild and my, my rest of my family, uh, but I'm but I'm very happy I did it, and I had incredible help from Sharon Goldinger. Uh, this book would not have have existed without her, so I'm very appreciative. Um, so so what did Dr. Bredesen do? It's really pretty simple. He he tested and found the metabolic imbalances in these people. And then he devised a unique program to treat them. And, uh, but in the process, what he was doing was showing the world that Alzheimer's was not one disease. And up until that point in time, everybody thought that it was. Uh, all the researchers were looking for amyloid uh, medicine, amyloid blockers and stuff. But they all thought that Alzheimer's was one disease. And, and they, they assumed that if they could find that one metabolic disruption or that one pathway or that one gene that was causing this disease, that that would be, uh, well, it would obviously, if it led to a drug, it would be a very, very useful tool. And it would certainly also make a lot of money. And they got kind of hung up on it. It's a, it's a, it's a, one of the, one of the now very famous uh, fiascos in the history of medicine, the, the, the uh, getting stuck on the amyloid hypothesis and wasting somewhere around a half of, uh, well, around $44 billion uh, and 40 
years of time trying to find a, a, a treatment that couldn't possibly exist. We now know, since we're dealing with a different disease in each Alzheimer's patient, that, that uh, we uh, have to treat it individually. And what we've further shown and what we'll, what we'll go into later is that lifestyle factors play a huge role in, in causing Alzheimer's. And lifestyle factors play out on, on a genetic scale so the, the um, it's not like listening to music makes you feel better kind of thing. We know now, to, uh, maybe that's not such a good analogy, but uh, um, the, the, we know now that lifestyle factors actually affect us very directly, uh, affect our genes and what genes are, are, are expressed and which ones aren't. And we'll go into that later, but, it ha but it's, we understand the, the uh, molecular biology and chemistry of it on a very minute scale. And these, these are the kinds of treatments that make that cure the disease, L lifestyle factors. And by lifestyle factors, I mean the food that you eat, the food choices you make, the uh, supplements and nutritional support that you take, and the exercise that you get. Those are the three main areas. You can add a fourth uh, important area, things like meditation, yoga, uh, mind uh, experience stuff that also has this direct genetic effect, which is uh, w deeply understood at this point. So, so uh, it's, it's a difficult concept for doctors and the medical profession to wrap their mind around the thinking that uh, rather than a drug, that a, that a drug for Alzheimer's is impossible, but uh, doing things like eating differently and exercising differently can, can make all the difference. But the science is, is now in place. There's absolutely no question about it. And um, we, can, we can move on from there. So I... I could stop now and we could start as, uh, talking about questions. I, I, I. We don't have any questions just of yet, but there's lots of engagement. So I think we're all pretty excited to hear from you. Okay. Well, um, let me, let me uh, start with some of the stuff that I wanted to focus on more. And that is, let me start with vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is a, um, a, a uh, it's exactly what its name says. It's a, it's a breakdown in the blood vessels in the brain. And so I'm gonna just back up and look at Alzheimer's, the, the, the disease, when you get, have a person with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, the, their, their brain is half blood cells and half nerves. And, and I'm going into this subject because it's, it's very personal for me, for one thing, because I, I, well, you'll see my story in a minute, but, but also it's very important because it's, a, it's a, a missing area in modern medicine's approach to Alzheimer's. We all think Alzheimer's is a brain disease, but the brain is half blood vessels. And, and virtually all people who have Alzheimer's have the diagnosis of quote Alzheimer's actually have vascular dementia, a disease of the blood vessels in the brain and the, of the nerves, both. 90%, there's a 90% overlap. And so, but vascular dementia is, is not usually diagnosed. It's not usually uh, seen and understood. So what vascular dementia is, is like a heart attack in the brain. It's a, it's a buildup of, of plaque in blood vessels or weakening of the blood vessels. Uh, and what happens is the blood vessels either break or get narrowed to the point where they're blocked. And that interferes with the blood flow to the nerves. And so the nerves suffer. So nerves get the damage, get the blame for the damage because the nerves are being damaged, but that's actually the vascular system, the blood vessels that are this tree that's growing inside the brain that, that's, at, that's really malfunctioning. And so, 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 as I said, there's a 90% overlap between, between uh, but in other words, 90% of people who have Alzheimer's disease have both the neurologic kind and the vascular kind. And so, and I was on a, on a course to be one of those people 
uh, I'm sure looking back, knowing what I know now, that my mother was, and that her most of her of her uh, uh, Alzheimer's was really damage to her vascular system. So there are three main causes for vascular dementia. One is, and when I say vascular dementia, you can just fold that into the diagnosis because they're 90% folded into the Alzheimer's group. That's not one or the other. Um, the, the three main causes are high cholesterol, high blood pressure and high blood sugar. And there may be a fourth in terms of high homocysteine. And of, of the bio, biomarkers that I mentioned that we test for, those are four of those biomarkers. Uh, they're, they're standard tests that any, anyone can do with or without a doctor. So, and I'm sure that what happened to my mother was that she gradually, she had low grade hypertension and that she gradually developed damage to her brain from the, from the high blood pressure and from uh, high cholesterol and deposits building up and just gradually eroding the brain. And that's what happens. Um, and there can, be, there can be no symptoms. In most people that have this disease, there are no symptoms. Uh, there's cognitive decline can, can be a symptom, but in terms of the kinds of symptoms that would make you suspect that it's, that it's the brain getting, getting damaged, there aren't. Unless you get an MRI and then you see them. And, so I was, um, in 2012, I was having fun, dinner with my family at Sushi Hana in Sebastopol. And uh, my, both my daughters were in town from college and, and um, I sat down to, to the table and I started feeling very spaced out. And I went outside, it was a very unusual feeling, I went outside and walked around and still felt spaced out. And I came back and sat down at the table again and the food hadn't been served yet. And I started noticing that I had some numbness in my left leg and in my lower abdomen. And I started thinking, whoa, this is looking like, like uh, a stroke. And so I, uh, my, my wife and I hightailed it over in Memorial Hospital and I was fast tracked and long story short, MRI was done that night. I spent the, the, on my brain and I spent the night in, in the hospital under observation. And sure enough, I had a very small stroke in my, in my uh, left parietal lobe. And, and the, the stroke was, was so small, it was about three quarters of a millimeter. I don't know if you know how big a millimeter is, about a pencil lead width, very small. And by midnight, it had, this is 7 p.m. when I went to the hospital, by midnight, it had resolved, it had gone away. Um, when I was a medical student, we would have called it a transient, transient ischemic attack, a TIA, but now we know a lot more and we know that it was a stroke. So I got, I went home the from the hospital the next day, I was fine, the numbness went away, I went back, I, went, I walked four miles the next day and everything was fine. But I started thinking about all of this and seeing it all in a different light. This is before Dr. Bresen came along. This is just my, in my own life. And I, I focused uh, really intensely on getting my blood pressure and my blood sugar and my cholesterol in line. And because that had been the problem. And I, and I started figuring out that that's what happened to my mother 15, 12, 10 years earlier, or uh, the, the, same, the same thing. So I just want to read a little section from the book. Um, it's called The Very Common Problem. I, I started wondering how many millions of people are on the same hapless trajectory, but aren't fortunate enough to get a shot across the bow like I did. Some online searching revealed flabbergasting numbers. About a third of seniors over 70 have had silent strokes. And, and as you'll see in a minute, I had had at least 15 or 20 silent strokes before I had the one that caused the symptoms that got me, got me to figure out what was going on. Even more eye-popping, 95% of people over 65 have small vessel disease, also known as white matter disease or WMD of the brain. So white matter disease is the medical term for these blockages in these small vessels of the brain that cause these silent strokes. I'm not alone. I can say that with considerable sadness. Vascular dementia, the kind that is caused by many small strokes is clinically indistinguishable 
from the pur purely neuronal form known as Alzheimer's disease. AD and VD, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, usually appear together, coexisting in varying proportions. Almost all dementia patients have some degree of both. The degree to which VAD is mistaken for AD is not known, but it must be very high. And I would add to that paragraph, it's, it's missed 99% of the time in, in uh, big hospital radiology departments when they, they, they diagnose white matter disease, but they don't go on to follow up with the patient and see that that's part of this progression to dementia. They just don't see it. It's not part of their reality yet. We're, we're trying to change that, but it's not their reality yet. The cognitive decline with VAD begins with cumulative effects of multiple minor strokes, also known as lacunar strokes or silent strokes, like mine. The earliest stage of this process includes the many strokes that show up on an MRI as white matter hyperintensities. So in other words, the, the, morning, the morning, when I woke up at Memorial Hospital the next morning, a, radio, a neurologist came by and talked with me and we, we sat down as two physicians and went over my MRI and he said, he said you see that? That's, that's your stroke, that's where, what you just had. And he said, you see all those other little, there were white spots all over in the same area of my brain. And um, uh, they were just little white, white spots, white intensities, we call them. I said, what are those? He said, those are WMDs, white matter intensities. Every single one of those is a previous silent stroke that you had that you didn't know you had. So, so um, that got my attention. And I, when I was writing the book, I started thinking, how, uh, how are we gonna re-educate the radiologists and the neurologists to see this as part of this progression of this disease rather than they, they put WMD on their report and, and send it off. There's never any kind of follow-up. Um, uh, so so um, they cause minimal damage and usually no symptoms. The, the white matter density, hyper intensities, they cause minimal damage, usually no symptoms. So they're casually dismissed by the reading radiologist, but are clear evidence that small strokes have occurred and that the small blood vessels that feed the brain are being damaged and blocked. In the short run, the price of these silent strokes is minor neurodegeneration, loss of neuroplasticity, and perhaps moderate cognitive impairment. But as damage piles up, symptoms of compromised thinking and memory gradually appear, and this is the road to dementia. And it truly is, and we have to change the way we're, we're processing these patients. I, Yes, I should feel fortunate that I was one of them. I call it my stroke of luck, but, uh, but um, it, I'll feel a lot more fortunate if the system starts picking out these cases and having a follow-up so that, uh, that because 90 some percent of those people are gonna end up with dementia. There's no question about it. So are we still without any questions? I can, I can do we more. We have actually quite a few questions and that was terrifying, but also so, <laughs> so many questions. Why don't we just get started? Yeah, if I make any mistakes, you'll know why. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, one question we're getting, you know, many, many times, Betsy wants to know, what is the Alzheimer prevention diet? <laughs> what is the diet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, what's, how, what diet is, would you recommend to prevent the onset? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna give you the, the short version. If you want the long version, you're gonna to have to buy the book and read it. There's a, a, a whole of four sections. One of the sections is the Alzheimer's diet, the, the anti-Alzheimer's diet. So, so the diet basically is low carb, very low carb, sugar-free, grain-free, low, low carb diet with high, high good fat and moderate amount of protein. To, and, uh, and I'll uh, to talk more about that in a second. The, the, uh, another aspect of it is that we recommend autophagy. Autophagy is, is a, a short fast every day to increase the amount of time that the body has to clean up and, and restore vitality to its cells. So instead of uh, uh, most people do this fasting at 
they, they add it on to their nighttime sleep. So if you have eight hours of nighttime sleep and, um, <clears throat> and uh, you don't eat breakfast until nine or 10 o'clock, then you've got uh, uh, almost 12, well, you've got 12 hours of fasting and 12 to 14 is the, is the ideal thing of going sometime during the day, going 12 to 14 hours without food. And there's oh, an entire chapter on autophagy. It explains what it is, how it works, why it does what it does, the, the, the kind of um, uh, molecular mechanisms that happen when the, when the cells are cleaning and restoring themselves are kind of remarkable to someone like me who's interested in molecular biology. Um, but, it, but I go into the details of how it works in, a, in language that anyone can understand. And so, so it's fascinating and it really is powerful. It's a, it's a way of getting your cells healthier uh, by, by basically if, if, if a cell is having to process food all the time, it, it can't stop and, and repair its damage and fix itself and clean up at the same time, it just can't. So by stopping all the food coming in for that 12 to 14 hour period, the, the, the cells can clean up and can do a, a much better job of it. And then, um, we, we in, in the, uh, in the diet chapter, I talk about foods that are good for you. And we try to focus on foods that are high in polyphenols, high in essential fatty acids, low in toxins, and are, are uh, I mean, there's many different reasons that foods can, can be good for you or not good for you. And we wanna think of this food in terms of the genetics that I was talking about earlier. We have, we all have uh, uh, all, we all have genes which can cause Alzheimer's and we all have genes that can reverse Alzheimer's. And what we want, and the, there are thousands of them on, on each side of the fence. What we are trying to do with this diet and with the, the, with the whole entire program in my book, all aspects of it, is to shift the balance so that the, so that the genes that are preventing Alzheimer's and making healthy brain tissue so, so that you're engaging those and expressing those genes and you're putting the genes to sleep that could cause Alzheimer's. And it really works that way. There, these, are, there are, these genes are real. They work in clusters or colonies. And um, so if you eat some of the foods that are, that are good for you, like eggs or walnuts or blueberries or all vegetables or almost all fruit, um, and I can give you more lists, more of a list, but basically the, the, foods that are, the foods that we tell you are good for you will turn on those anti-Alzheimer's genes. And they have lots of different ways of doing it. So, so diet's really important. And then there are foods, foods that you want to strictly avoid, foods like sugar and wheat. We know wheat and grains, the things that we all love and have terrible time not, not eating. It's bad for Alzheimer's too. There's no question about it. Um, uh, pro sugar, sugar is very damaging. I, there's an entire chapter on sugar and I go into the research studies that show how much higher, even a little bit of sugar in your diet, it raises your risk of Alzheimer's dramatically. And um, so also processed foods like processed meat and cheese, fast food, junk food, um, um, foods that are cooked in aluminum pans and Teflon pans. Uh, there's, there's a lot about what, what not to, uh, what to avoid. And, and we like very clean food because the things like additives, preservatives, stabilizers, pesticides, all these other things that are in food that make it not really food are very toxic to the brain. They go directly for the brain and damage it. Uh, in addition to additives and preservatives and pesticides and stabilizers, there's uh, nitrates, coloring agents, again, sugar, MSG, aspartame, artificial sweeteners, and BPA linings, and and there's more. That's just really? part. Of this. So does that help with the diet part? Read the read the chat. There's a lot of really good things that you can eat. It's not like a deprivation diet. It is a little bit hard to cut back on carbs, 
uh, for most of us. And, and if you read the chapters on, on sugar and, and carbohydrates and the diet chapters all have a, a lot of explaining about why these carbs damage us. They, they interfere with the way we metabolize uh, ener energy, the way energy is produced in the body uh, by increasing insulin levels and by damaging the insulin receptors on the, on the surfaces of our cells. So minimizing sugar is a big deal in terms of protecting your brain from damage. Oh boy, you just had me tallying things in my pantry. <laughs> um, that right there is enough to purchase this book. I, there's tons of comments thanking you for elaborating on that. And I think a great segue that we're getting lots of questions about is top three supplements that you would recommend to add to the diet. Top three supplements. Okay, well there there are there are um, chapters on eight or ten. I guess it's ten different supplements. So it's hard for me to pick the top three, but I guess sure. I'll do it. Um, the the top three I would pick are are and I wasn't pre-programmed about this. Uh, uh, lithium is absolutely at the top of the list. Lithium is an amazing substance. It's a it's an essential mineral. We're talking about low dose lithium, not the lithium from one flew over the cuckoo's nest that they give to crazy, you know, very depressed patients. It's low dose lithium, about a hundredth the, the dose. And lithium is essential for the brain to function. It increases uh, memory, it increases cognitive functioning, and it increases IQ. And it's been shown to actually, and they're, they're very good studies done over a period of many years, numerous studies showing that it reverses Alzheimer's disease. Everybody should be taking a little bit of lithium in Tim's world. So, so that's the first one. Um, curcumin is the second. <clears throat> curcumin is uh, the uh, essential chemical in turmeric, the herb. And uh, uh, curcumin, um, has uh, powerful effects on the brain and on the body. It has anti-vascular uh, disease and anti-cancer effects in addition to its, to its um, brain enhancing effects. Um, there is a, an entire chapter again in the book on curcumin. And it starts out by pointing out that, that uh, in India, the Alzheimer's rate is one fifth of what it is in our country. And a lot of people and a lot of heavy duty science researchers think that it's the curcumin that's ever present in Indian people's diets. So, so there you go. Um, 15,000 research studies, it's been extremely well studied. I go into the, the uh, details of, of how it works and what it does in the book. And, and um, so, so curcumin would be my second. And, Boy, a third, I think I would choose DHA, although they're, they're all second in their own way. I, um, uh, DHA is docosahexanoic acid. It's the, it's the essential fatty acid, the omega-3 fatty acid that's in, in fish oil. And, um, uh, and but we, we don't recommend fish, eating fish because it's got too much mercury in it. And I go on ad nauseum in the book about how mercury is bad for the brain, even teeny amounts of mercury are bad for the brain. So we don't recommend fish, eating fish, but, or seafood, but fish oil, or you could get DHA from algae and that, there's an algae source that's totally uh, fish free. There's also fish derived DHA where they've uh, done this molecular distillation process and remove the, the uh, mercury and so and, and other toxins so that so it's purified. So Icosa Max is the name of the product. You, you have to be careful with these products because they don't, most of them don't take out the mercury. So you don't want to just go eating some fish oil. That would be a big mistake. The one that I do recommend is called Icosa Max. So any other questions? Oh, we have plenty. <laughs> Actually, I want to ask you, um, an attendee named Michael sent in this question. It's a little long, but um, bear with me. 
Um, he's wondering, could you please speak to the ways that younger persons in their 20s who have experienced dozens of transient ischemic attacks over the years, noted by who brain sneezing sensations and rapid memory loss could bring healing to the damages that have occurred at the brain and heart levels? Um, if he says he'd need to know more factors to answer, the person is eating a whole plant-based diet rich in fats for years, no medications or supplements, Lime panel ruled out twice, healthy weight, comprehensive blood work, not reflecting much. I don't know anything about 20 somethings having transient ischemic attacks. I'm not familiar with that research. I, I, I don't doubt it exists, but I'm not qualified to answer that question. I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, the, the kind that I'm talking about, these, the, what, what may be going on there, and I'm strictly speculating here, is that they're getting transient ischemic attacks of the brain due to irritants uh, and spasms in the wall of the blood vessels, which can cause a kind of, uh, it can cause either migraine type symptoms or it can cause uh, various uh, brain function disturbances, cognitive impairment. And, and uh, I don't think in a 20 year old patient in 20 something patients, I don't think atherosclerosis is the basis for the problem or blood sugar, and maybe not even blood pressure. Uh, the things that cause damage over time and show up after the forties really. Uh, in, in someone who's in their twenties, I think there's a different process going on altogether than what I'm talking about. And I don't think that that, from what I heard just described has anything to do with vascular dementia. I'm sure that's very helpful. Thanks for answering that. And kind of switch gears a little bit more. Many, many questions about the metabolic imbalances. Ellen is wondering if you could please give us some information or examples of the metabolic imbalances that are related to Alzheimer's. Well, this is where that thing we were fiddling with earlier comes in. Right. Uh, so so this, is a, this is from a page in the book. I hope I'm getting it in the place where it needs to be here. And, and these are the, this is a, a diagram that I put together um, and it sort of explains, is that good enough? Yeah, we can sort see of, that. It explains how, what, you know, the whole idea of what causes Alzheimer's. Now, for each of these items that are in the outside arrows, we have blood uh, or other kinds of tests to determine what they are. And um, for example, with hypertension, you take blood pressure. For fasting blood sugar, we get a fasting blood sugar level. And I could go on around. The, some of the things like toxic metals, we use hair analysis for that. And um, cholesterol is blood. I'm having to read this upside down. Let's see. So sleep apnea requires a, 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 for people that snore, they should get tested for sleep apnea. Um, so these are the, the main categories. And there are chapters on each one of these. And there's also a full uh, lab test order at the end of the book that people can fill out and, and uh, use as a model for, and I tell you where you can get lab test orders without a lab test done without a doctor's order, if that's necessary. Doctors, uh, uh, the, the, so, so all of these things cause inflammation that inflammation leads to degeneration of the nerves. And then we have loss of neuroplasticity and synaptoplasticity. Uh, let me explain what those are. Loss of neuroplasticity is uh, nerve cells are able to grow and change and make new connections depending on their experience. And so uh, a healthy brain is continuously making new connections with nearby cells uh, through their dendrites. And um, uh, synap uh, neuroplasticity is the ability of nerve cells to grow and change. Uh, I was going to talk about neurogenesis later on, but uh, is that enough? Can I? Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. That's great. Um, and, and Hannah is wondering, again, I'm just kind of firing questions at you. <laughs> Everyone's so interested. Um, have you heard if thyroid disorders can be related to dementia? Yeah, one of the one of the arrows on here should be hypothyroidism. Um, absolutely. Well, it's in the hormonal balance. Uh, hormonal balance. I didn't separate it out, but there's an entire chapter on 
hypothyroidism. Hi, uh, a low thyroid definitely causes uh, cognitive decline and, and dementia. It's one of the major causes. And um, if a person, and I show in the chapter how to figure out whether you've got a low thyroid, there's a test you can do at home called the Barnes Basal Metabolic Temperature Test, or you can, you can, uh, you should also get blood testing and look at the, uh, the only three parameters you really need are a, a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, a free T3 and a free T4. And from those three numbers and the information in my chapter, you can figure out whether you're hypothyroid or not. And also I go into great detail about how to treat it because the mainstream medical community has some very skewed notions about what's what actually is hypothyroidism and how to go about treating it. And I, I go off on a little rant in that chapter uh, trying to get them back on the right track. They tend to miss a lot of hypothyroidism cases and, and I'm, I, uh, my editor, Sharon, tried to make me get rid of some of it and I insisted on keeping it because, because it was so important to me to change the, it's, it's like with the white matter densities, it's something that medical system is doing wrong. And I thought if I explain how to do it right, it might be helpful. So, but hypothyroidism is definitely uh, a, a, a major contributor to, to dementia. Wow. Um, a couple other questions. Well, Bridget is asking a question I'm interested in too, is I know it used to be said that Alzheimer's couldn't actually be diagnosed until one dies. Um, is there any truth behind uh, that? Is there any truth about aluminum being a negative? Um, is there any updates on, on Alzheimer's being diagnosed? Well, um, a good neurologist can, can determine whether or not a person has Alzheimer's pretty, pretty, pretty easily. And um, it's true that the definitive diagnosis requires a tissue sample and a microscope. But, but um, uh, you know, when there's, my, my way of looking at this is this, if a person has cognitive decline, they wanna start doing something about it right away. Whether, whether the neurologists get around to diagnosing it correctly or not, you still wanna treat it. And this, this approach that I describe in the book is the best way to do that. You, you eliminate, you do the testing, which is not that big a deal to do, and eliminate the, the possible causes not narrow it down to the ones that are that are there, and then treat them. There, it's it's a good idea to do that, even if those aren't the, what's causing the cognitive decline. It's a good idea for optimum health to fix your cholesterol or to get your thyroid back uh, on track or to do all of these other treatments. So it's not a not a mistake. It's not a waste of time or energy. And um, I I think that. Uh, being overly concerned about getting that, you know, people really want to know, you know, do I have Alzheimer's? You know, it's, it's not always 100% possible, but when you have cognitive decline, the best thing to do is to assume that it's Alzheimer's and, and act accordingly and use the information in my book to reverse it because you don't want, you know, the longer you wait, the harder it is to reverse it. it uh, prevention is the best early treatment is next best. And the longer a person waits and the more they wait to see whether, you know, maybe their memory is gonna come back, it probably won't unless they fix the metabolic imbalances that are causing that loss. So, so I don't worry too much about whether there's a tag of Alzheimer's stamped on the person's chart. It's, it's, it's uh, best to assume that cognitive decline has a reason and find it. And it is a good idea to go to a, a neurologist. What, what the problem with the neurologist is that unless they're very unique and on the Dr. Bredesen's uh, uh, team or, or, and follow the, the principles in my book, they're not going to know what to do. They're gonna ride down a sinking ship, so to speak. They're gonna see that patient and maybe give them some drugs that suppress the symptoms of the Alzheimer's, but they won't be doing anything to reverse it. And reversal is the name of the game. It's the only 
game in town. Wow. Yeah, and for all of you asking, you know, specific questions about the names of supplements and diet, be sure to get this book because it goes into much more depth. It's, in all, it's all there. It really, I spent a lot of time on the diet and supplements. It's, it's half the book. Right. It's very clear about why to take these things and which ones to, to use. Right. And just a, a couple questions here to kind of take us out even. Um, you were speaking about Dr. Uh, Bredesen's research and Mary excuse me, Marcia is wondering, has your research and information led to updates um, on recommendations in his book, The End of Alzheimer's? Has, has, could you say that again? Has my- yeah. has your research and information led to any updates on Dr. Bredesen's recommendations in his book? The oh, End of yes, yes. Uh, wow. <laughs> yes, Dr. Uh, Bredesen is uh, my hero. I, I he, he, uh, uh, wrote the testimonial on the cover of my book and and liked it a lot and uh, recommends it. Um, his his uh, book is amazing, really, and it's a breakthrough book. Uh, I think that my book is different from his in a couple of ways. One is one is that I uh, his book has a lot of theoretical content and a lot of ideas. Uh, but it's very difficult to, to come away from it knowing exactly what to do. My book is just the opposite. I, I went out of my way to, to hold the reader by the hand and walk them through exactly what they need to do to find out what the problem is and, and then to treat it. So it's a, it's a, it's a how-to book uh, as much as I could make it one. And so the other thing is Dr. Bredesen's book and, uh, and I don't think there is any other book about Alzheimer's. There are a couple other books, but none other, other about Alzheimer's that talks about epigenetics. The thing that we touched on earlier that's, uh, that's uh, my deepest interest lately, it, it's kind of the next phase of all of this, the, the work that Dr. Bredesen has done and, and others. <clears throat> and it has to do with, with what uh, turns genes on and off. <clears throat> the, the, the epigenome is a cluster of proteins that sits right on top of our DNA in our genes and talks to it. And the, the epigenome talks to the DNA using chemicals called transcription factors that I mentioned earlier. And the, the um, experiences that we have through lifestyle factors, as I, I also said this earlier, to talk to and dictate what those transfer factors are, trans what transcription factors are, and the, and and in turn what DNA gets expressed. It's and so uh, um, it then the, the next phase of research is has to do with this, and it has to do with finding the uh, combination of behaviors and supplements. That, that we're on the we're on the road to it already. Everything in my book is is a transcription factor generator, but but uh, I mean all the the diet and the supplements. Uh, but but as the research gets further along, the the since these transcription factors work in clusters of thousands at a time, and working on thousands of genes at a time, programming the the uh, outcome, the genetic outcome is something that, that they're working on. And it's gonna take a lot of computers and a lot of research, but uh, I think ultimately we'll be able to do a much better job of recommending the, the treatment programs that will reverse it and more, maybe making them more individualized so that each person, maybe we won't have to give up our wheat, you know, maybe, I, I wouldn't hold my breath, but <laughs> it may just be some people. Right now it looks like it's everybody. So, you know, so. Well, I think it goes without saying that um, your knowledge uh, of the topic is beyond respectable and that this is a how-to manual that we can really use. And um, I think one last question will be perfect to end on um, from an anonymous attendee. Even if you don't have symptoms, would it make sense to follow Dr. Smith's recommendations for lifestyle changes and testing? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm embarrassed that I, it's it's in all my notes to myself of what to say tonight, and I <clears throat> somehow managed to not do it, but I'll do it now. I'll do it now, <laughs> and that is prevention. 
prevention, prevention, prevention. If you adopt the lifestyle that I'm recommending in the book now, and you're, you're young, you don't even have to be young, as long as your brain is working and they don't have any symptoms, you can keep it that way. There's a 99% chance that that's gonna be the case if you follow the program in a preventive way. And so, and that's the, that's the beauty of this whole set of ideas is that we now have the information and the knowledge we need to prevent this awful scourge of Alzheimer's. Oh boy. I mean, what a time. I, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us this evening to, to dive a little deeper. And thank you to all of you who joined us. I will be in touch with Dr. Smith tomorrow. We had so many questions that um, I might have to run by giving your email address if you'd be open to I'll it. I'll try and answer them in e e emails or however you want. So that yeah, would be I'd be happy to do that. Great. We're trying to spread the word. The whole idea of this is to spread this word. Alzheimer's is reversible. Right. Right. So hang on to those questions and I will follow up tomorrow with everything you need, discount codes, um, how to ask questions, where to buy, and um, a link to rewatch this again. So thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Any last last minute things you'd like to say before we uh, take it out tonight? Uh, just thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. Great. And thank you to all of you. Hopefully we'll have you back. Oh, well, let me, can I give my website? Absolutely. Uh, it's timsmithmd.com. Write it down. Don't forget it. Timsmithmd.com. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will be in touch very soon. Thank you. Bye.